I'm delighted this afternoon to reintroduce uh, Daniel Fierstein and uh, Thomas O.A. Quintana, uh, both of whom you are now rather familiar with. Um, the format is that I will chair uh, this, this discussion. I might intervene at various points. But essentially, Daniel will speak for 10 minutes, followed by Thomas for the another 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions and contributions from the floor. And it will be a sort of a dialogue. So, Daniel, thank you so much. Um, over to you. OK. So thank you, everyone. And my idea in these 10 minutes is to try to, to point out why it is important the discussion on genocide, because it is sometimes a tiring discussion about definitions and details. And it is trying to point out why, why it's important. And I, I will talk a little bit about the Argentinian experience, taking in account what the Professor Spivak told us in, in the previous session, that law is not justice, but taking in account the Argentinian experience, we have a fiction in modern societies in which law is the way in which societies used to create collective tools. And that fiction works. So in the case of Argentina, after 30 years fighting against impunity and trying to convict the perpetrators and to trying to qualify what happened as genocide, it was quite important to work through the society through the consequences of genocide. So even if as a sociologist, I know that this idea that law creates collective truth is a fiction, is a fiction that works. It's just one element. The day after the first sentence in Argentina qualifying the facts as genocide, all the newspapers in the country had in the cover genocide. And then the explanation about what happened. It would have been impossible with our work in the human rights movement, in the academia, in other parts of the country, working with the people in universities, in schools. But in the moment in which a tribunal decided that genocide happened in 2006, the day after this sentence in the city of La Plata, all the newspapers covered were genocide. And it was very important for working through the consequences of genocide. So what is the definition of genocide and how we can use this definition, I think it is important to think about the situation of the Rohingya population in Myanmar. The gen term genocide was coined by a Polish Jew lawyer that could think very sociologically, Rafael Lenkin. And for Lenkin, the main definition, the core of the definition of genocide was the destruction of the national identity of the oppressed group and the imposition of the national identity of the oppressor. It is very sociological, and it is very interesting. Two elements that are fundamental. First, genocide is about identity. It is not only about the killings. It is not only about the bodies. It is about identity. And second, genocide is a way of oppression. It is a way to change the identity of oppressed people. So the distinctive feature of genocide, according to Lenkin, is that it aims to destroy a group rather than the individuals that make up the group. And the ultimate purpose of genocide is to destroy the group's identity and to impose another identity. And Lenkin used to say there are two ways. One way is to impose the new identity on the survivors. And the other possibility is to impose the new identity on the land. So you can kill all the members of the group, or you can kill the identity of the group, or you can kill both. And that's the ways in which you impose a new national identity on the land and or on the people. So the idea is to deny to some population, to deny to some part of the population, the right to be part of the community. I think that's very interesting in the case of Myanmar, even denying the name of that people. And the idea of any genocide is that people don't exist. But that people, that people never have existed. The idea, even in Nazism, was that Jewish were never part 
of the European identity. The idea in the case of the Etihadism in Turkey is we need a new pan-Turkish identity in which Armenian, Assyrian, Greek have no place because they were never part of our community. So they don't exist, but they have never existed. So all the discussion is about this element of the identity. Why? Because identity is a constructive process. It is not an objective process. The communities are imagining. And that's why I, I agree with some comment by Penny regarding it is important to go to the 16th, 17th, or 18th, or 15th century. But finally, the most important element is that all communities used to be plural. They used to include different identities. And all the discussion is what kind of community we are creating, with which tools, and which is the way in which terror and the killings could create another ways of identity. The genocide convention, beyond its problems and gaps, have defined five actions, which are the facts of genocide, the five elements of the second article. And it is quite important to see the situation in Myanmar, trying to identify them. The first is killing members of the group, but it is not the only one, it is the first killing members of the group causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. The third element is, in my opinion, the most important in this case of the Rohingya. It is deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. So creating conditions in which the identity <coughs> is destroyed, not only key members of the group, and the fourth element is imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. And the last element, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So that's, those are the facts. And then we have the concept. The concept is genocide, which is not a fact. And that's the problem of some discussion. Concepts are not facts. Concepts are abstract theoretical constructions to understand the reality. But they are not facts. So the concept is something in which we put together different facts, killing, imposing conditions, causing serious mental harm, and we say, well, the real objective of these facts is to destroy the identity of a group in whole or in part. As it is the real objective of those facts, so there is a genocide. So that's the way to understand the concepts. The problem is sometimes many young lawyers used to confuse concepts with facts. And use try to create evidence of something which is a concept, trying to have the, the fact, the intention as a fact. But the intention is not a fact, it's a conclusion, the way in which we analyze the reality. How much time do I have? One, two more minutes? You have three more. Ah, three? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, <laughs> now we are going I would have run my, my bell. Eh? I would have run my bell. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, now we are, I'm going to the, to the, my first objective. Why is this important the discussion? And I think that the ways in which we analyze what happened to us modifies our actions <coughs> in the present and in the future. So when we analyze that our identity was destroyed, we can do something to recover the identity, we can do something to recreate our identity. So the main discussion in the post-genocidal societies <coughs> is trying to recover the identity of the oppressed group, the identity of the annihilated people, as part of the identity of the whole society. And sometimes it was not the case. When you have this binary analysis that the Germans killed the Jews, the Turks killed the Armenians, finally, we are legitimating the perpetrator's mind. Because we are saying, okay, we have Germans, we have Jews, and they have nothing to do. So what about the German Jews? They have killed themselves. So the idea of this conception of genocide as an imposition of a new identity of the people is the possibility to think 
about us as a community. I think that in this case, I think that one of the most important elements in the discussion is if the Rohingya are being part of the community of Myanmar. But it is not a question of how old is his history in the territory. The question is that they or you are there now. <coughs> so it is a part of the community, and the discussion is that there is some other parts of the community who think that they shouldn't be part, they don't exist, and they have never existed. So I think that that's the most important consequence of the discussion about genocide. Because if you call this situation crimes against humanity, you are saying the state is doing some hard things about against some people, some individuals, but it is not about identity. Atrocity crimes is not about identity. Ethnic cleansing is not about identity. So that's why it is so important, the war. It's not because it is most serious crime. It is because it's the only concept to give us the possibility to rethink about our own identity. Thank you very much, Daniel. That's, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll clap at the end and we'll just continue. Um, I think we'll go straight to Thomas and then I might ask a couple of questions before I Thank you. Um, I think uh, your point, Daniel, is, is, is quite important, the, the question of identity, particularly uh, in Myanmar. Because uh, in Myanmar, you have uh, the Rohingya community as an ethnic group, but you have also hundred ethnic uh, groups around the country. So I wanted to to address this 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 point. But um, but first, um, um, as as Professor Sibak said said, I am I'm, I'm here as a witness. Uh, I spent six years as a reporter in Myanmar. I have seen a lot of things in Rakhine State, in Northern Rakhine State. Um, and uh, I and uh, I think that these these kind of uh, spaces are, are the best uh, opportunities to share with you and eventually to to give testimony in in, in, in any, in any uh, procedure that uh, in the future might be established in respect to Rohingya. Uh, and we are comfortable here. This is a great place. Uh, it's a nice place, but uh, and we can we can say Rohingya freely. We can mention, we can see Tungkin and say Rohingya friend without problem. We, we, we can also uh, discuss about genocide freely uh, without any constraint, but uh, this is not a reality out there. Uh, in Myanmar, uh, and we have seen recently what happened with the, with the US Embassy and so on and so forth, you cannot refer to you as Rohingya. And the, and the question about genocide, uh, the United Nations in, in especially has been reluctant, or it is reluctant, to even touch the, the issue. We, we could, some of the UN uh, people who have, who have been working on this, we, we could talk about crimes against humanity, but uh, we couldn't reach the, the stage of uh, starting to discuss genocide. So, this is, th that's, that's the real thing out there. So we have <coughs> the reality of Rohingya suffering uh, the consequences of, of segregation. Um, and you, we have also the reality in Myanmar, where you see the international community uh, really endorsing this democratization, endorsing the NLD government, and uh, actually not, not say anything about uh, what's going on in other countries. That's reality, and uh, if, if we wanna if we if we wanna look into practical course of actions or solutions, we need to take that into account. Um, during my mandate, I visited not Rakhine State, but I also visited uh, border areas like Kachin, Karen State, Chin State, Shan State, and I talked to other ethnic minorities. And uh, those ethnic minorities also suffered similar patterns of human rights abuses like Rohingya, for example, mm -hmm. lack of access to humanitarian aid. 
you see that in Kachin State, particularly now, we are, uh, we are, we are the government uh, uh, strictly controls the, the access to, uh, to, of health from the International Committee to, to the IDP camps, to the villagers who suffered the consequences of the civil war, uh, which is still going on in Kachin State. So um, this adds a, a, a complexity to the problem of the Rohingya and how to address uh, the, the, the issue because if it, because the other ethnic minorities have their own claims to the international community. Uh, so you have some, sometimes you have an overlapping of, of, of claims from, from different ethnic communities. Now, of course, a very important element is that as long as I know, uh, as far as I know, sorry, uh, the other ethnic minorities from border areas do not recognize the Rohingya at all as an ethnic minority from Myanmar. Uh, whatever is your condition in terms of citizenship or whatever, uh, it has to do with the question of identity. So if you have the majority of the Burmese people still holding that old idea about Burmanization of Myanmar, and you have also the ethnic minority from other areas not really you know, expressing any sympathy from, from what's going on in the Rohingya. So it's another element of complex, complexity in Myanmar really serious to, that we need to look into. Um, what to do? What to do? The, uh, in a couple of months, actually in June, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations will, well, actually the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, will, uh, will issue a, a report on ethnic minorities, including the Rohingyas. And we need to pay attention to that report. And if we can, we should influence those writing that report, lobby them. Because that will be, as uh, Professor Sibak said today, not the end of the road, the UN it will be the starting point to, to design a course of action. What that report will say that will represent somehow the, uh, the, the, the ideas of the member states of the United Nations, the international community, governments, states, ambassadors, will be reflected in that report. So we will need to use that report. Now, and I was, I was looking to some other report. I don't know if you, many of you know this report, but I will uh, read to you a couple of their recommendations. And this report says, for example, in respect to the IDP camps in Rakhine State, says, while the Rakhine IDPs are adequately re resettled, there have been difficulties in resettling, resettling the other IDPs. The Rakhines have called for resettlement of, of other IDPs only after verification of their citizenship. However, it is becoming extremely urgent to provide the other IDPs with access to safe and secure temporary shelters prior to monsoon session. Schools should, should be reopened and access to education provided for students living in the other IDP camps. A concert effort is needed to plan and prepare for long-term food security, meet immediately food shortages, and address malnutrition. The government shoulders the responsibility to meet the basic needs of the IDP populations until their livelihoods are restored. It is vital, therefore, to consider all possible means to revitalize the livelihoods of the IDP populations. This is the report of the Rakhine National Commission established by the government in 2013. These are one of the recommendations, some of the recommendations. So what I'm trying to say with this is that there are, there are some stuff out, out there to work with coming from the government. We haven't seen any signs from the NLD and Aung Suchi's government in respect to what they will do with, with, in, in North Rakhine State, except 
by point, uh, appointing the, the, the chief minister, uh, which hadn't shown any, any willingness to really address these kind of issues. So um, uh, this report was released while I was a reporter uh, in Myanmar, and I criticized this report because they are not talking about Rohingyas, they are talking about Bengalis, etc. But there are some things that we can use uh, for the future and for any, 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 any plan of action. Um, and uh, so one last point, uh, 21 minutes if I have. You definitely. Okay. It's uh, the, the, the question of uh, a, a culture of, of impunity. Uh, and this is uh, a culture that uh, has been there for, for decades and has to do not only with what happened with, with you, with the Rohingya community, but also with other ethnic minorities. There is, there is, no, there is, no, uh, there is, there is no any culture of, 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 of hold responsible those who, 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 who made decisions and, and committed human rights abuses throughout the years. And this, this is still a problem there. There is no judiciary at all where you can at least go and present a case or try a case so this will be will still be a problem for, for the future uh, and um, and um, and we need to type uh, to have this uh, into account uh, if we wanna if we wanna uh, go forward with a case in respect to Rohingya uh, one 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 possibility would be to try a, to try a court in the country to bring a case before a court to the Supreme Court. <coughs> what, I mean, to bring an habeas corpus maybe to the Supreme Court and study, you know, a course of action. I mean, the law, as as, as Daniel said, sometimes it is useful to point out issues, and uh, and uh, and uh, because the the the, 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 the NLT government would say, look, we just started, give us some time. We, we might bring solutions to these people. Um, I mean, so you will need to exhaust domestic remedies, maybe, because they will bring this defense, the, the government and the authorities. Let us exhaust the remedies. We will solve the problem. So what, what, what one course of action will be to try a call. But these are only just ideas. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you both for wonderful presentations. Um, and now, um, if I might, um, abuse my chair's position and, and start with a couple of questions. Um, I think it, it's really fascinating <coughs> what you were saying, Daniel, and I think um, there are two points that I want you to, to address. The first is our discussion over lunch. We were, we were talking about the, the very, very problematic term ethnic cleansing. And I wondered if you could... And uh, given the shortness of time. If, if, I'm competing with Sorry. the Sorry. Um, but if, if you could elaborate a little on the problematic nature of ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity, because I think that these terms really muddy the waters, uh, and, and um, I think that your position has particular purchase with respect to the Rohingya. So that would be the first question I'd like you to address. I will try to be brief, but it's quite difficult. The problem is ethnic cleansing it has two, two fundamental problems. First, it is a concept created by the perpetrators. It was a concept created in Eastern Europe. And particularly to, to accept the idea and to spread the idea that our territory and our community could be purified. So that ethnic cleansing is exactly this idea to clean our community ethnically speaking, and to create an homogeneous society, which is also fiction, and this idea that some parts of the community are not part of us. So to use that concept, even with the idea to criticize it, it is quite problematic. The first meaning, because it accepts this idea that the society could be purified, and that we are against that but it accepts that it could be. And the second problem is that it doesn't exist in the law, in the international law. So it has no consequences. So we are, sometimes, when UN representatives or different scholars used to say, it is 
the same uh, seriousness of the situation, and we are really worried, but it is not there is not a genocide there, it is just ethnic cleansing. So we have to create a convention. In the meantime, nothing will happen. So that's the second problem. The problem of the tax against humanity, I need more time, but in the beginning, in, in, the, in the aftermath of the Second World War, there was two ways to deal with the situation. One was the military tribunals and the creation of this idea of crimes against humanity, which is so subjective, it is not clear what implies. It is something, I would say, senseless, because what is a crimes against humanity? And why some crimes are against humanity and others are not? So then, right? Is it crimes against humanity? It is not important, not serious. So why the right not, but the genocide it is? So it is it's some, somehow senseless. But the other element, it, it was created without a precedent in law. It was created to break the law through the military tribunals, particularly in Nuremberg. And the genocide has the opposite genealogy. It was created through a convention discussed for all the state representatives and it was applied only after the convention was approved. So the genocide concept was not used in the Nuremberg Tribunals because it was decided that it would have been used after the approval of the convention. So that's why, in my opinion, it's a very powerful concept and it's a very important discussion. Great, and my second question to you before I turn to Tomas. Um, uh, it's very interesting, this notion of recovering identity, you know, identity recovery. And it seems to me that we often we talk about this notion, normally, as you're talking about in Argentina, some 30 years after the event, when the fiction of law allows for the public discussion uh, and the opportunity for the recovery of identity. Now, I think when we can observe, if, if we use a social process understanding of genocide and recognize that we are in the midst of a genocide, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what we can, how we can advance this notion, like to start to deal with the recovery of identity now, so that the Rohingya do not lose their identity completely before the Soviet genocide is complete. So I, I, I wondered if you might reflect on that idea. Yes, I think that the most important element is to understand that all of our identities are plural. Identities are plural, and we have many elements in our identity. And the genocidal process tries to eliminate some parts of our identity. But if you are able to think about our community as plural, I think that's the main element to challenge that, to heal, to expel, to persecute Rohingya and some many other groups that Thomas mentioned is to transform the whole identity of the society in Myanmar. And I think that's the most important element to highlight. It is not only a problem of the Rohingya. And it is what Thomas mentioned that sometimes the stigmatization is part of the same groups that are being persecuted. It's real in many historical processes because that's the way in which stigmatization works. The idea that to convince you that you have to fight only for your recognition as a part of the community. So the idea it is a fight among the different groups that we are part of the community, but they are not. And we are part of the community because they are not. And that's the way in which the state used to divide the communities, and it is a way to oppress the different communities. So I think that the most important element is to understand this plural element in all of our identities because it is true that suffering doesn't teach only suffering. It's not true, it's a myth, but it's not true. When you suffer, you suffer. But if you are not working through your suffering, you don't learn anything. You just suffer. So I think it's quite important to work through the consequences of terror, if the terror is ongoing, if the terror is past terror, trying to challenge our own identities, our own homogeneous <coughs> identities, and trying to create more plural identities and to recognize our plurality in ourselves. Thank you, Daniel.
And I suppose following on from that, Thomas, I wonder if you would comment a little on you know, six years in, 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 in Burma, you were all over the country, in the border regions as well. Um, but thinking about this notion of plural identities and the way in which the, the Burmese state, the Myanmar state, has pitched uh, certain elements of, of the society against each other. Uh, and, and that's very, very visible in Rakhine State, where the, the Rakhine, who from our <coughs> own research we observed were deeply oppressed themselves. I mean, they, they have very real grievances <coughs> against the, the regime. Uh, it's the second, at least the second poorest uh, state in the country, um, massively underdeveloped. Uh, and yet, rather than explicitly direct their grievances against the state, though they do to some extent, they, it's much easier to, to, be, to scapegoat the Rohingya. And I wondered in your six years, um, how much time you spent uh, talking with the Rakhine, uh, and, and, and what sort of way forward do you think that the possibilities of working with the Rakhine in order to uh, address the, the, the current um, oppression of the Rohingya? Burma or Myanmar? Yes. Well, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. But I think I was he said that people that call Burma can keep calling Burma. Did she say something like that? Yeah. Well, if she said it, I'm not sure <laughs> what she did. No, yeah, no. She said either name is fine. Either name is fine. Yeah, I said this because every time that I went to the country, at least with the authorities, I couldn't say Borma. I mean, with the, with the generals, um, you should say Myanmar. But to, to be honest, well, I started to visit a, a, a Rakhine State before the violence started in 2012. Uh, and I was just getting into what was the problem for Rohingya. I remember going to Mongdo uh, and, and talking to the people and talking to the leaders. I remember one meeting with, with, the, with, with the Rohingya leaders in Mongdo, and <coughs> including, for example, Dr. Tung Ong. And he was there, uh, and, 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 and the government uh, agents were in some other room. And I was talking to them, and I asked them, do you consider yourself as Rohingya, members of the Rohingya community? And this was before 2012, and they, and they couldn't answer. There was a silence in the room. And none of them said, yes, we are. And, uh, and uh, so, I, so I started to understand that with that, what was the real problem there? Now, um, uh, then the violence uh, erupted in 2012, and I, and I was really shocked uh, about what we were seeing, you know, the, the kind of violence and how, how, how things were somehow pre prepared in some, in some parts, etc. Um, uh, so then I, then, then I went again to, to, the, to, 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 to Rakhine State, and I, I, I went to, 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 to the IDPs. And I went first to the Rakhine IDP camp with the government authorities. And, uh, and it, it was a, a good visit to that camp. Uh, we checked on, on the conditions of the camp. Uh, the government prepared some events there. Uh, and then, well, and then I, I went to, 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 to the Rohing, to, to Rohingya camps. Uh, I also tried to meet the members of the Rakhine National Party. We had meetings. I tried to hold, I, actually I, I hold a meeting with the members of the Rakhine National Party and members of the Rohingya community in 2012, in situ, trying to build bridges, something like that. Uh, and it was very difficult, it was very difficult. Um, but it, I, I couldn't, do anything in favor of the Rakhine people that will make them understand that we were impartial. And the fact that if I was going to Rohingya camps, is, it was just of part of my job. And uh, it, there was no you know, a biased approach and anything like that. It was very difficult because the, the media campaign started uh, and, the, and, the, and of course the, the government um, didn't help at all. The federal government and the, the, the state government didn't help at all. So, um, 
and and and, and, uh, and so uh, always try to hurt the 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 the, 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 the community with respect to, to the grievances throughout the years, uh, the, 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 the poverty, the, the, the lack of lack of resources in that state. That's what's really very important issues. I try to include it in my reports always trying to trying to show balanced approach, uh, but uh, I think it, it was very difficult to, to make it work at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, I want now to open it up for questions and contributions from the floor. I might take uh, two at a time, in fact. So. And could you identify yourself, please? Yes, my name is Hadai Ali. I'm from Bangladesh, Rohingya Refugee Game. I would like to, uh, to put uh, a request to Mr. Quintana regarding the unregistered refugees who are remaining in Bangladesh, more than 200,000, because they are very serious situation from various issues because they don't they doesn't have any access assistance from the government or the UN. It's, uh, my point of view is I, I would like to restart them as the refugee other who are uh, living by Abraham Kutubalong. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then uh, uh, thank you. Uh, in the case of uh, Rohingya uh, what def exact word we can conveniently use in the uh, genocide? Because uh, we, uh, there are, as to genocide, there are many, tra many terminologies uh, are using, like uh, hidden genocide, uh, slow violent genocide, slow genocide, this way. Maybe the, these are, they are using convenient, uh, confer I mean, the technical purpose or a strategic purpose, they are doing this. But what exact word we can use in the case of Rohingya? The second question is, is there any difference as to extent of the crime and offense between the genocide and the other adjective tag genocides? Thank you. We know we, we know that the, the Rohingya had to many Rohingya had to live in Myanmar and they are in, in many neighboring countries uh, like Malaysia, Indonesia, and also Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, and uh, in particular, in, particularly in Bangladesh, it has been very difficult, at least for me as a UN envoy, to to reach to reach out the, the area and the, and and also the authorities from Bangladesh to discuss the conditions, the living conditions in those camps, and that's still a very important concern. Um, because in, in Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, there are some uh, people working there, uh, but in Bangladesh has been, I mean, apart from what's going on, of course, in, in Rakhine State, Bangladesh has been, still has been a, a very critical situation, uh, because we don't know exactly what are the living conditions, what happens, uh, uh, with the Rohingyas living in uh, Mondo and going to Bangladesh and, and so on and so forth. The information is, is not quite clear and, and not, there is a depth there. Uh, it's, 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 I agree with you. Okay, so due to your question, I'm not an expert on the situation of Myanmar or the Rohingya, but I have pointed out five types of actions, five types of facts which are in the convention, Article 2. And then the intention to destroy in whole or in part the identity of the group. So if you have both elements, any of the actions and the intention, if it seems for the evidence presented, it seems they are there. If you have both elements, so you don't need all the rest of the elements. It is just a genocide. In law, you can have an homicide, and it doesn't mean that all the homicides are exactly the same. You can have a rape, and it doesn't mean that all the rapes are the same. So you can have a genocide with 
millions of victims, you will have a genocide of hundreds of victims. It has nothing to do with numbers, because numbers are not in the definition of genocide, in the legal definition, beyond the sociological understanding. So the two elements you need is one of the five parts and the intention to destroy the identity of the group. So that's the elements going through the definition. Last uh, month, um, we had with the International Crimes uh, State Initiative, we had uh, two panel discussions, and there was Professor Mukesh uh, Kapali, um, a special uh, UN um, activist, and also he is involved with the Darfur genocide. And then at the end, we have spoken that uh, none of the genocide has been, um, what do you say, um, are prevented and none of the genocide has been also overcome till today. Well, that is an optimistic and a very positive point, but when, whereas when I see the situation of our people, or Rohingya genocide, I think m this might be possible that the genocide will completely take its all stages and we will be completely wiped out of this, uh, uh, on, from this earth. So to uh, our chair, Professor Penny, and uh, um, Professor Quintana, and you, um, Professor Krajstan, I have a question is that what we, Rohingya, outside Myanmar, not inside the Myanmar, as we can just heard from the Dr. Quintana, that's very difficult for those people. We, Rohingya, outside the country, what can we do more besides only attending the conferences or making the lobbies or awareness? What do you want us more to do so that this 1.2 million Rohingyas is left over from 3 million? What the active actions can be taken that we survive further? Thank you. Um, just on the question of citizenship, do you worry that if, and a big if, if the government were to get to a point, and if Myanmar society were to get to a point where they were back citizenship for the Rohingya, that that could actually be the trigger for a sort of resumption in even greater violence, given sort of how often that perception of status reversal has been the catalyst for you know, genocide elsewhere in the world. Um, and particularly so given the lack of, sort of state security um, or state protection for the Rohingya. Um, so yeah, just on the question of citizenship, you know, could it, could it prompt another crisis like we saw in 2012 if it were to happen? And therefore, should people really be pushing as far as many people are for citizenship without that kind of like parallel campaign to sort of destigmatize Rohingya? In fact, I think um, they, they are related questions, but um, it might be easier to address Francis's question first and then come back to Ambia's more general question about what is to be done. Would you like to start with that last question? Well, Francis, of course that, that is a possibility. I mean, we have seen yesterday that there was 700 people in front of the US embassy because the, 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 the US used the word Rohingya. So, to start a policy towards addressing the question of citizenship and actually to, to, to give back uh, nationality to, to, to Rohingya, I mean, the, the answer would be there is, a, there is a possibility. Now, then the question is uh, how to try to avoid that in order to respect the rights of the Rohingyas. And that will require a long-term strategy from, from this government, which I, I, we are not seeing. But that's the challenge. Try to try to try to press the, this government, and and, uh, and and I always go back to the UN because that's where I come from, and and I know different agencies working there, and some of the, these agencies are not committed to work on substantive issues. You have the humanitarian agency of the United Nations. You have UNCR. They are just assisting the communities. But there are some other UN agencies that have the responsibility to address these more substantive questions in respect to nationality. And, uh, and um, so again, uh, 
we are expecting a report from the Office of the, uh, of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, there is still pending the, com the com compromise of the government to open a, a, a national office in Myanmar, the uh, uh, High Commissioner's office in Myanmar. That's still uh, something that uh, the government uh, needs, needs to address. Uh, and um, and uh, definitely, uh, I think that uh, at some point, this is something that we need to be addressing in Myanmar. Particularly, I haven't seen it much signs in this respect. Okay, so regarding Ambia, the question is a very difficult one. Uh, difficult to answer what to do. I would say the only I can answer you is our learning from the experience in Argentina in the human rights movement, in the moment in which the genocide was ongoing, and in the moment after the genocide, the human rights movement and the people <coughs> in the outside tried to do whatever they could. So the denunciation in the UN, the opening of cases, the demonstration in the country, whatever they could. And, and these different strategies that were really rich, because there was a lot of strategies and a lot of action in different parts of the world, Finally, some of them were somehow successful. So some denunciation created the possibility of the visit for the <coughs> Inter-American Human Rights Commission in 1979, and it was very important trying to soften the way in which the genocide was killing the people. And then the opening cases in Italy, Spain, Sweden, Germany, other countries, push the government more and more in the international arena, trying to, to be able to reopen the cases. So it was a long process, and that's the only thing I could answer. I don't know if it will be successful in this case, but just try to do when, when you don't know what to do, you have to do everything. So one thing will work. So we don't know what is possible, one thing will work. Because the, the cleavage point is the isolation process. In the six stages of genocide, I would say that stigmatization and harassment are present in any society, in any modern society. But isolation is the cleavage point. And then it is really easy to go directly to the extermination process. So trying to break the isolation, and for what uh, Thomas told me during these days, in Myanmar, the isolation of the Rohingya are more and more serious. So trying to break this isolation, trying to create ties with other groups, even with these other persecuted groups, trying to work with people in the community, trying to work outside the country, is quite important, because it is the element that could give the difference. You are successful breaking the isolation, so the genocide will be more difficult. If the isolation is there, the total extermination will be possible, will be easier. And, and just, thank you very much, Daniel. Just before we wind this session, if I could just come, come back uh, to your point, Francis, and, and, and this very quickly. I think that the question of putting citizenship back on the table, if, if, we're, if, if, if we fear that that will initiate a backlash, then we should also fear that any concessions made to the Rohingya will initiate a backlash. And I think that we have to be very, very careful about, about standing strong and, and expecting that, but, but fighting that at the same time. I, I think that, uh, that can't, we, we, we can't hide behind the fear that doing something to end prejudice will increase violence and prejudice. I think that would be a, a dreadful mistake. Um, coming back to Andy's point. Okay. Yeah, That's one more sentence after you. Okay. And, and finally, in terms of, of what could be done, I mean, I think Daniel's right, there are, there are swathes of things, including sanctions, which we haven't discussed today. Um, and, and I know that there's an argument about how effective sanctions are, but they, they were effective in South Africa, and they can be effective, in, and they seem to be being effective in Israel, Palestine. Um, but the other question, the other issue that, that, that you mentioned, Mukesh Kapila, and the sessions we held with the Sudanese community, who are also experiencing an ongoing genocide. Uh, and there is something to be said for bringing those communities together, for uh, encouraging, I think, the Sudanese 
uh, diaspora to perhaps visit, as, as I had suggested at some point, but to, to perhaps visit Burma, to meet with human rights activists who themselves at the moment are, are bigoted and prejudiced against the Rohingya. But these are the kind of steps that we might look to towards forging some kind of united um, uh, approach to, to dealing with the question. And I have to give Daniel uh, one more sentence. Yeah, just one more sentence, because I, I was a bit worried about one element in Dr. Spivak's dissertation previously regarding the information and evidence. And I think that for these multiple actions that you can do inside Myanmar and outside Myanmar, the kind of information and evidence produced by Sami, by the reports uh, of Thomas Quintana, by the report produced by Penny and Thomas, are of fundamental importance. Because when you are going to give uh, testimony as a witness, the first element of any court in the UN, in any country, the work you have to do is give me the strong evidence about what is happening. So this production of evidence and, evidence and information is a fundamental importance for any kind of action you are willing or possibly in Do you want to last sentence, Thomas? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, but in respect to, to your question, um, I always um, uh, uh, thought that uh, during my meetings with the Rohingyas in Mondo, in Butidong, in Situe, um, it was always very, very difficult to hear the voice of the women. So there is, a, there, there is something there that is, is lacking in, in, in the community. Uh, maybe it has to do with religion or not, but I think that you will need to reconsider uh, to include their voices uh, uh, in, a, in, in a way that it's more visible and more a, even more attractive to the international community. Because the other ethnic communities have used, it, used that very well. Uh, and uh, with the Rohingya, uh, no. And, uh, and it, it, it has been even quite stressful during those missions in, 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 in the far away uh, IDP camps to talk to the men and not able to talk to the women. And I understand the religious reasons, reasons maybe, but it's, it's something that you may reconsider. I think that's a very fine point on which to end this session. Please join me now in thanking our two colleagues.